Welcome everyone. Um, tonight, I'm really excited. We have Dr. Eric Jackson with us and he's going to talk a little bit more about some really, some of the stuff that makes Chiari so hard to treat and diagnose in the first place. Um, so I'm really excited to just hear your presentation. But before we get started, I always ask the presenter to talk a little bit about why they're interested in Chiari, um, or syringomyelia or what have you, uh, how you got involved, and um, I guess a little bit about why you're interested in all of this. So, but in order for you to do that, I'm going to disappear so you can do your presentation, um, but start with a little bit about yourself, and then you can go right into your presentation, and afterwards we'll do some Q&A. Sound good? Okay. Um, so I'm Eric Jackson. I'm an associate professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins, and um, primarily a pediatric neurosurgeon, but I treat adult Chiari as well. It's primarily the main adult diagnosis that I care for. And it's just kind of been an evolution in practice over the years of something that I was um, dealing with and then seeing more and more patients. Um, and often at a place like uh, Hopkins, seeing some of the more complicated patients and trying to figure out what's related, what isn't, what can we help, and 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 what can't we help. And so um, that's kind of the, the segue and the intro to what I was going to give a very brief um, discussion on and then kind of go into um, time for Q&A and, you know, maybe a little bit of feedback as well. And so no real disclosures. We always have to have these slides. Uh, obviously, Chiari is one of these things that there is always some bias and that you probably talk to 100 people and get a 100 slightly different answer of exactly what it means and what it causes, et cetera. Um, I think it is something that the bias can change over time. And I think the way I treat things now is probably different than the way five, six, seven years ago. Um, and I think it really is a learning experience kind of each you know, with each patient, learning from the last patient and different experiences and, and how can we use that to move forward. Um, so I think some of this and some of the talk comes out of, I'm working on the Chiari guidelines and I'm not gonna talk about it too much because I know the speaker in two weeks is uh, David Bauer, who's actually uh, heading the, the guidelines committee working on, on Chiari. But I think it does give a little bit of background and uh, into the questions that we're thinking about. And and really the guidelines process, again, I'll just briefly, is just we come up with questions that we want to answer and then get professional help to kind of search the literature. Um, there's actually a librarian that helps with that. We identify the relevant papers and go through all of them. And then we talk about the, the level of evidence for those papers and how that allows us to make recommendations and what are the strengths of the recommendations. Now. Um, Here's a slide I, I borrowed from the Hydrocephalus Association website. And the idea here is just there's different levels of evidence. Um, and based on the levels of evidence, that gives a uh, differing strength of, of recommendations. So obviously randomized controlled trials are going to be the best evidence um, and down the line. Unfortunately, as looking through the literature for the Chiari guidelines, we find that most of the evidence in Chiari is levels three, four, and five, um, which obviously affects the, the strength of, of recommendations. Um, so when we think about evidence and, and Chiari malformation and, and where to go, I think you know the guidelines we're working on are, are really based on what has been done already. Um, and again, I think it's primarily case series, um, you know, patients at a certain institution who had X or Y and Chiari and did, did those symptoms get better or not. Um, there's not a huge number of studies that compare surgical versus non-surgical patients. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, different reports within that literature and, and, and series. Now the Park Reeves, um, you know, Dave Limbrick at WashU is the PI for that and it includes both a registry and a trial. Um, we're, we're part of it uh, as well at Johns Hopkins. And um, it's, the population is limited though in the fact that it is pediatric patients and it's patients with a syrinx. 
Um, so it's great in the fact that there's a registry, there's multiple sites, there's good data that's tracked well. There's also the clinical trial looking at surgical um, differences, looking at opening the dura versus the not opening the dura. So there's really good evidence in it, and, and it should be um, level one for that the trial. Um, but it is only in patients with syrinx, so there's a lot of patients out there that the study doesn't necessarily um, reach. So what we have is, is really, and when I think about Chiari, it's really a complex problem. And when we're seeing patients and trying to figure out what's going on and, and what can we do to help, really the, the, the main crux is trying to get at what's related to Chiari and what isn't. And a lot of the times that's a lot harder to, uh, to do than we think it is. Now, obviously there's the classic features such as the cough headache or the Valsalva headache, um, the tussive occipital headache that we talk about. And I think the important thing about that is that's a feature when, when patients have the classic features, it's very easy to tell them that if we intervene, that there is a good likelihood that we're gonna make that better. I think the further out we get from the classic features, the harder it is to know. And that's where those other symptoms come in. And so in terms of putting together a talk and going online, I think one of the you know, places where you don't feel bad about referencing something is Wiki. So if you just Google, um, or you know, if you Wiki Chiari malformation and symptoms, you can see you come up with this massive list of symptoms. And a lot of these are in babies, and then there's some other things as well. But the hard thing about these symptoms is that there's a lot of other reasons for these things. And there's, and so just because someone has a Chiari malformation and these symptoms have been attributed to Chiari malformation at one point or another, doesn't mean that in any given patient that those symptoms are gonna be related to it. And so trying to get at what can be helped. And so going back to it, you know, every time we're, or you know, I'm having a discussion with the patient, we're kind of getting at the likelihood that the symptoms are related to Chiari. And therefore, you know, the next step from that is then the likelihood the symptoms will improve with treatment. Because obviously, there's not really much point in doing something if you're not going to make something better. We don't treat Chiari to, to make the image better, potentially with the exception of, of syrinx. Um, we're really treating it to, to try to make the, the patient's symptoms and, and quality of life better. And so, you know, long-standing symptoms, sometimes even it's related, you may not be able to make it better. But I think, you know, first figuring out if it's related and then will it improve are kind of the important things in terms of trying to determine uh, what we can do. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other diseases that patients can have symptoms and they can be difficult to separate. So obviously, EDS, um, cranial cervical instability, whether related to EDS or, or not related to EDS, um, POTS, migraines, you know, all of these, um, whether disease processes or symptoms, are things that we see in patients with Chiari malformation. Um, and the question always that comes up is, um, are the symptoms from the EDS? Are they from the Chiari? Um, is the, and you know, how can we try to get to the bottom of that to figure out whether or not we can we can make them better? Um, you know, especially with connective tissue disorders. Obviously, um, when there is a concern for symptomatic Chiari, there's also the secondary concerns about how the connective tissue disorder may affect healing and how does that affect uh, surgical decision making. And so within all of these things, then the decision is, is what treatment are you going to do? And I think really, um, from my perspective, it's really kind of putting the imaging and the symptoms together. Um, you know, obviously, there's going to be a range of imaging and a range of symptoms. And it's really um, kind of trying to combine those to come up with the, the best treatment plan for, for each individual. And then obviously, you know, if you're getting to the point of surgery, what's the appropriate surgery for that patient? Is it a bone-only Chiari decompression? Is it a, a duraplasty with tonsillar reduction? Or if it's primarily cranial cervical instability, is it, a, is it a fusion surgery? And so I think 
you know, the way we think about this and why it's complex is there's so many questions at so many different levels in terms of what is or is not from Chiari, if it is, what's going to get better, and, and how are you going to treat it to make it better? And there's questions at each of those levels. And so obviously, you know, looking at the guidelines and, and working on those, you know, we kind of see where the literature is and what we have. Now, obviously, the clinical trial out of the Park Reeves has not been published yet. Um, I think the data analysis is ongoing. And we do have, um, you know, there are a bunch of manuscripts from the, the registry. But I think, again, that's that's searing-based. And so uh, I know um, the, the group at, at Bobby Jones has been working with a lot of centers with uh, Doug Brockmeyer at Utah being the PI for the Chiari Surgical Success Scale um, and looking at different symptoms and, and all different factors of, of patients um, with Chiari undergoing surgery. And obviously, um, this will be helpful for answering more questions, but one of the problems with it is, you know, resource dependent. It takes a lot of resources to be able to collect a lot of data. And so at this point, this is really only gonna be looking at surgical patients. So it's not gonna include um, the non-surgical patients. And so um, uh, hopefully in the near future, at least from, from our group, where we will be announcing the Johns Hopkins Chiari Clinical Research um, uh, Center. Um, we, have, we are very close to finalizing with a donor to, to philanthropically help us fund um, our own clinical research center, which I think it, it really is in the formative stage and a work in progress based on a lot of the things that, that we're discussing. Um, you know, there are at least seven of us uh, at our institution that are doing Chiari, uh, both on the peds and adult side. So we have a very large um, uh, volume and of both operative and non-operative patients. And we all do things a little bit differently. Um, and so trying to come up with a prospective data collection that we can capture data on all the patients that come in to be evaluated, both operative, non-operative, um, can look at the things kind of like in the other scales, like what's been looked at for in the Park Reeves and the data that's going to be collected in the CSSS, but also add to it and, and include other variables. Um, including non-operative patients and, and what happens over time if people aren't treated. And I think it is one of those things where, you know, we definitely are going to include patient questionnaires. And I think one question for, for the audience is, you know, how much are patients willing to fill out? How much are they willing to share? And I think, obviously, there's going to be a difference, too, in the sense of, the, the people who are coming to, um, you know, webinars like this versus somebody who just has an incidental finding and how can, um, how can we try to combine those things to really come up with a, a good data set um, to be able to answer some of these questions, both um, in and of ourselves as an institution, but also collaborating with other institutions. And then the other thing I would say to put out there is obviously, um, you know, as clinicians, we have a lot of questions that we know we think would be helpful, but what are the things that, that patients want to know? And obviously, we get asked a lot of those questions clinically, um, but are there things that, that would be more helpful for us to know? Like, as I said, as uh, hopefully when the funding goes through, we'll be meeting as a group um, to kind of go through the data points that we want to collect and have everything, but I think having um input on that is something that that's always helpful and um that was the main you know part of the talk that i wanted to to put out there um and then just kind of open things up for questions comments or answers to some of the questions that that i put out awesome thank you dr jackson okay um so just to remind everyone, you can use the chat to ask questions as we go. Um, I don't know if you want to keep this shared or not, so I'll just uh, let it happen for a little bit. But um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions just about like what is medical evidence, because it's really kind of complicated, and I think it's worth having someone explain it a little bit. So 
you, you kind of talk about this a lot, but you, you touched on it. There seems to be a lot of research being done in Chiari, even mm -hmm. over the past 10 years. It's really kind of ramped up. But I guess a question that ha that comes up from patients a lot, um, understandably so, is there's still a lot of controversy over what appear to be pretty basic things about Chiari. So what the five millimeter rule comes to mind. Um, I guess the question is, you talk about it on that slide with the levels, but what is good medical evidence and um, why doesn't it exist for Chiari or does it and it's just not accessible? Um, and that's a big question, so I'll just let you kind of go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think like like you alluded to when that um, that slide from before, which I guess I can go back to from uh, the Hypocephalus Association, is kind of the different levels of evidence. And I think um you know when we there i think a lot of what we see is in some ways level five in the sense of personal observation and that's really where um we i think in terms of the five millimeter three millimeter i think the problem with those definitions is they're radiographically based um and even the problem within that is, I know all of patients come see me because they're worried that the Chiari got worse because the measurement changed. And when you actually put the images next to each other, they're exactly the same or they haven't changed. And some of it is you're applying an objective criteria to a measurement that in it's some way subjective because you're drawing two lines and you're basing one line on the other and the measurements based on that, but it's not actually a very precise line. And are people measuring it in the middle? Are they measuring it to the side? So my general practice is more to look overall at, you know, what does the frame and magnum look like, for instance? Does it look tight? Does it look compressed? Is it full? And not necessarily make as much out of the the exact number. Obviously, if someone comes to me with a report that says two centimeters, then I know it's going to be bad. But I think anywhere in the three to 10 range, I've seen pictures that can be dramatically um, different. Now, there were, um, you know, there was a group of people who, who met to kind of go over this a little for kind of shared data. And they did stuff with the, at the NIH to try to come up with parameters that can be measured and used and those I, I think because that's more recent we haven't had necessarily a significant literature kind of using those common variables and I think it is one of those things that that as time goes on and people start using kind of those variables that are, are, are meant to try to to make things more uniform um, it hopefully should be helpful I think a lot of the data in Chiari is retrospective, meaning, um, you know, a, a, a group will have done a bunch of cases and say, hey, we should look at, at what we found. And the problem with retrospective data is it, you don't necessarily get all the details. And so you're going back through a medical record um, and you're looking for things. And if something isn't there, is it because like if it, if something isn't in the record, is that because they didn't have it or just because it wasn't documented? And so I think that's why when, you know, trying to set up this, you know, our, our prospective database is the type of thing to try to trigger, to ask all the questions of the things we want answers for. So it, it's clearly a yes, no versus an unknown. Um, and so I think that helps to to answer things better. And I think the the reason why there's still so much controversy is, you know, I, I started with my disclosure slide talking about bias. And I think there is, again, this is a field where it's complex. And so there's a huge amount of bias based on what each person does. And so the problem is there their case series is going to show their bias and somebody else's case series. And so when you try to put these things together, you 
don't have good comparable data. Um, and so I think that's where like the, you know, the, the trial out of Wash U is helpful. I think the CSSS and the things kind of moving forward where you have different institutions with comparable data um, that then it allows you to make better comparisons. And um, the person who um, our, our hopeful donor is actually from Europe and he's actually asked us to potentially partner with an institution in his home country where in talking to them, it's interesting, they operate on Chiari a lot less frequently than we do. So we were talking about even for them to contribute significant amounts of data, we'd have to include the non-operative cohort and how, you know, what would we learn over time comparing across our institutions with very different practices of, you know, who gets better, who doesn't? Should we be operating on less people? Are their patients doing better? Should we be operating on more people? Are our patients doing better? And trying to hone down on, on those criteria for for who we can uh, help and not help. So I think, you know, the the guidelines I think is going to give us a good sense of where the literature is today. And in some ways, from working on on them, I feel like it's also going to give us a good sense of what are the holes. Um, and even though there's a lot of things being done, you know, where's the stuff that can really help me when I'm seeing a patient in the office? And I think that's where um, you know, I think things are lacking. Now, that being said, I think just the fact that we were doing this bone only decompression trial and seeing some of the results of patients with that, I think, you know, when I trained, I was opening everybody's dura. And, and since then, seeing that I've, you know, a number of patients did well with the bone only, I've, I've brought that into my practice more. And so I think we all kind of learn and try to hone from those things, which again, again, that's level five evidence, like, hey, I had a patient that did well. Um, so at the end of the day, to really give good answers, we need more level one, level two um, types of, of things um, to, to move forward. Does that answer that question? Yeah, it does. And I guess to, to round it out, so the, the studies that we're talking about so the CSSS isn't a level one. It would be closer to a level two, just to Correct. give it an idea. And then the, the, the PFD trial that you're referencing, is that that's a level one, correct? Correct. So, and that's coming soon, so that's really good. But Right, so the good thing is, there's, level, so we have one level one that will be published soon. Again, of course, it's, it's a limited data set in the sense of it's just patients with syrinx. But on the other hand, I think, you know, with a complex patient population, in some ways, it's useful to have an objective radiographic finding that you're using as an outcome because there's no placebo effect. There's no, like, there aren't underlying biases that can affect the outcome um, for symptomatic relief. Sometimes, you know, when I say placebo effect, it's not something that means somebody um, is just thinking they feel better. It's it, it actually, they do feel better um, and there is a change, but you don't know whether it's actually because of what was done or just the act of, of, of having something done. So it's not a, um, the, the patient isn't doing anything wrong and feeling better, um, but there is a, a bias in some ways in how our minds work that if we do something, we should feel better. And so that that helps. So having an objective data finding of does a syrinx get bigger or smaller, I think provides um, excellent data in that regard. But we're also collecting these other points. And I, I think one of the things that will be very interesting will be to see symptomatic relief as tied to syrinx improvement or, or not improvement. Um, you know, I actually have a patient I'm following now whose symptoms got dramatically better, but the syrinx didn't. Um, and so how does that, you know, is that more likely than um, syrinx improving, but symptoms not? Now, I, I actually, in my mind, would think that probably would be more likely that you could have, um, that it, it's more likely to get symptoms better without the syrinx getting better because maybe of a block the flow, 
Whereas if you do enough to make the syrinx better, I would think that should make symptoms better as, as, as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> I actually, I really hope that there's more work with placebo in this space because placebo, it gets a bad rap. It, people think that it means um, you're imagining that you feel better, but you really do actually feel better. And I, I it's fascinating to me, but I can't jump ahead. So. <laughs> um, I, I did want to ask this. So this is really important. Um, if can you explain what is a natural history study? Um, why is it important? And do we have any that really address Chiari and Stringomyelia? So um, a natural history study effectively is what is the natural course of a disease process if you don't do anything about it and you just follow it over time. So meaning a uh, patient has a Chiari malformation and never is treated, never does anything that people think should make it better or worse, et cetera, what happens to it over time? Um, do, do they develop symptoms and get worse? Do they not develop symptoms? Um, and I think um, Cormac Marr out of Michigan has, has, has very good papers on natural history amongst uh, many different disease processes, but Chiari is one of them. Um, and other groups have looked at it as well in terms of, you know, patients that are seeing what happens to it over time. And, and for the most part, you know, I think the experience is most patients stay the same. Now, obviously, as someone who, who treats kids, I think the younger you are, the more likely you are to potentially see a change in it over time as relates to growth. Um, so I think the youngest patient, so I have a number of babies who've had imaging that maybe had a bad Chiari that got better or, um, or didn't have a Chiari when they had a scan when they were one and they come to me when they're five and they have a Chiari. I think it, it becomes less common the older patients get. So since most of the studies that look at these, you're not getting that many one to two year olds having MRIs that have Chiari. Most of them show that the majority of patients stay the same. A small percentage get better, a small percentage get worse. Um, you know, there are some patients who have spontaneous improvement in their syrinx, others who it gets worse over time. So I think overall the majority don't change but you know it's the type of thing that that i tend to follow especially through the growth years because because you can see um differences but i think knowing the natural history is important to know what an intervention does so if if the patient that nobody does anything to gets better then is there a benefit to intervening to make it better? Um, and so I think that that's an important detail. Um, actually, that kind of segues a little bit into my follow up there. So I guess it's different for kids versus adults, but about how far out do you typically follow a Chiari patient post surgery? Um, so yeah, so I think it is different kids and adults because if for me, I tend to, and syrinx can change things, like depending on if there's a syrinx that's, uh, you know, a massive syrinx that's gotten better but not gone. Um, but for adult patients who are kind of fully grown or like 18 year olds, uh, I tend to follow for about a year post op um, and get a get a scan at that point. And if it was just headache symptom or just kind of a uh, decompression without searing, then at that point say, call me if you need me, or if symptoms come back. Um, with a five-year-old or something like that, I probably would see them back in a year or two, a year maybe, depending on how they're doing another, and then probably wait a number of years for them to grow, and then see them back to see if that, that changed at all um, with growth. Obviously, with searing, It'll depend a little bit more on, on what's happening with the syrinx. I like to establish a baseline. So if I get a scan at a year and it's smaller than it was three months post-op, I may see them back a year later to see if it's still smaller, if it's the same. Because I don't want to miss 
the patient that it had gotten smaller and then got bigger again. Um, so I like to try to have a stable scan looking at the syrinx um, to have a sense of where to go. Okay. Um, and then sort of just to round this out, we're talking about what happens after you have a QI diagnosis, but what kind of a patient comes into the clinic that makes you think, oh, maybe this is Chiari or syringomyelia. So how do how do they come to that MRI and then they say, oh, there's a Chiari there? So I, it's a little that's a little bit of a harder question in the sense of because most of the time to get to me, they've had the MRI, um, mm -hmm. at least demonstrating the the Chiari. Um, and then in terms of syrinx, that is something that that we will diagnose because I, I I usually get a spine MRI on um, almost every patient that I see for Chiari, the exception being the, the people that come because there was a question of Chiari and you get the films, you're like, that that doesn't look like a Chiari, you're not gonna have it. The, the likelihood of a syrinx is gonna be so low. Um, you know, I think in terms of symptoms, you know, it's hard because what, you know, my practice will range from somebody who had a concussion who got an MRI, you know, because they had headaches that weren't going away or, or symptoms related to a trauma to, you know, patients that went years with kind of clear symptoms of syrinx that that just hadn't gotten imaging. Um, and so it, it really is the, the full gamut. I think probably in the adult patients, it's more chronic headaches that leads to, to scans or you know, chronic headaches plus numbness. Um, every once in a while, it'll be a patient with a hearing change that they get a scan of um, looking for something related to their ears that they then then see it. Um, actually, I had an interesting patient who who had that, and then you start talking to them, and they have strain-induced headaches, and then you get a scan, and actually, I had a patient like that who actually had a syrinx as well. Um, so, you know, it's always interesting, and I think um, you know, at the primary care level, I think experience affects how soon people present because of level of concern regarding certain symptoms. I think going back to that, the slide with all the different symptoms, I think the issue there is um, because, you know, I think one of my colleagues has a talk about Chiari, the great imitator, and it goes back to the fact that you know, you look online and every symptom a human has described at one point or another has been attributed to Chiari malformation. Whether or not it actually is in any given patient is a, is a different question. Um, but I think that's, you know, something that that's a little bit hard. And I think honing in on the, the more common symptoms uh, is probably the, the more useful thing. Actually, we got a question that came in, sort of, you, you talked about trauma. Um, how often does it seem that Chiari results from, or at least becomes symptomatic following a trauma? So have there been any MRI studies comparing pre and post trauma? Is I, That's really hard to do with it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, one of the interesting things that always comes up with Chiari is, um, you know, the discussion of, um, you know, restrictions. And so relating to trauma, like, can I not play football because I have Chiari, et cetera. And there's, I had reviewed this for a talk at the Congress and there, um, there are a lot of case reports that have patients who had a bad trauma and then they found a Chiari or something bad happened and they found it. Um, there's, there weren't any reports of a patient who had a known Chiari who then had a bad trauma and and things got worse because of it. And again, I think the the Michigan group wrote a paper looking at sports participation in patients with known Chiari, and they really didn't find a significant impact of that. Um, and that, you know, in patients who weren't symptomatic of Chiari, that it was probably safe to, to do those activities. Now, there was a, a paper that I, I reviewed, and I think it was actually put out by the Trial Lawyers Association, which you always have to wonder about bias there. Um, but there, I think it was that patients who, they looked at two groups of people who had whiplash injury and people who didn't, 
and the tonsils were lower in the group who had whiplash injury. Um, you know, I, I don't know that that's a study that, I don't know the trial lawyers paid for it, but they cited a lot. Um, so, but that I think really was one paper that kind of looked at that. I, and again, going back to level five evidence, I do have some adult patients who have pretty significant Chiari malformations on imaging that had a trauma and then became more symptomatic. So I tend to think of it more that it's probably more likely that the, and again, level five, I don't have good evidence to support this, but just my theory is, you know, if things are tight there and you have a trauma, you may irritate things, it gets inflammation, and then it's more likely to trigger symptoms rather than, you know, the imaging necessarily changing. And, and for example, a patient that I treated recently actually had had a scan previously when they were less symptomatic, and, and I didn't think the scans actually looked um, that much different. So I, in my mind, I think it can be a trigger um, obviously, a severe trauma, if you have elevated intracranial pressure in your head or kind of getting into the CSF hypotension, which is another complicated thing I'm not, not sure we want to get into. Um, but obviously, if you cause something else that can cause secondary PRE, then obviously, um, uh, sure, in a limited population. But uh, my, my general impression that is probably more making people more symptomatic from something that's there rather than, than worsening the imaging. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions about like symptoms, I think, because we have a lot that could come in. Um, this is a, this is a good one. So um, is there anything that would cause low back pain in Chiari? And then the same question, but in syringomyelia, because I think it's different. Um, so I do think it's different. It's interesting. I was just talking to a mother today um, that the primary complaint was low back pain. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, I personally haven't seen it that much in the absence of syrinx. Um, so obviously in a patient with syrinx or tethered cord, um, you know, there are other things that can that can cause the low back pain. You know, as an isolated symptom from from Chiari malformation without syrinx, um, I, I haven't seen it as much. I think a lot of the times patients can have low back pain is such a common diagnosis um, that I think you know it's one of the more common diagnoses, especially in adults, that's out there. And so I think more likely than not, it's going to be true, true, and unrelated. Um, but is it something that's impossibly related? No, but I, I think more likely it's, it's going to be a, a secondary process. Now with the syrinx, I think pain is going to be much more likely and in, in neurologic symptoms related to that. I tend to, when it comes to symptoms, I tend to try to think of it as an anatomical process. Now, I think the hard thing is there are symptoms that there are reports of getting better that I can't explain based on this. Um, but when I think about, okay, well, what's going on with Chiari? And it's the fact that um, either the, the brain and uh, dura and that whole area of everything's kind of being squished together because of the Chiari at the frame and magnum, or a spinal fluid kind of abnormality. So it's hard for me to think anatomically how that would cause pain in the low back. Whereas it makes sense to kind of have it in the neck or in other areas. Again, it's just ways I try to simplify things for it to make sense. But going back to the original slide, it's a complex problem. So I wouldn't operate on somebody probably for low back pain in isolation. Could I tell them 100% definitively that it's not related? No, but I would probably recommend looking for other sources in the absence of searing. Is there anything that uh, is like something like PT? Is that something that might help with low back pain? Have you seen it help patients who it might be attributed to the Chiari before they get surgery or anything like that? Um, so, I mean, obviously for low back pain, PT is kind of a staple of treatment. Now, I think it's as primarily a pediatric neurosurgeon, low back pain is not a, a yeah. problem that I treat very frequently. And honestly, if I had a 
Chiari patient who had it and there were some imaging findings, I would probably send them to one of my spine colleagues for that assessment. Um, but, you know, physical therapy is, is really a mainstay uh, as a primary treatment pathway for um, for low back pain. Now, one interesting thing that, that I tend to say about Chiari is because it's an anatomical problem, I tend to think that really that surgical treatment, at least as far as we know, is really the only thing that tends to make it better. So if you do things like physical therapy or go on migraine meds or other things like that, and you have a significant improvement from those things, to me, it suggests that it's less likely to be related to Chiari, and therefore you should continue doing those things that work and, and shouldn't really pursue um, therapy for the Chiari directly. Um, that's a good point. Okay. Um, in your experience, have you seen any association with Chiari and speech delays, disorders, or learning disabilities, particularly in pediatric patients? Um, so again, these are um, association and causation are, are different things. Um, and so obviously, you know, we have patients who have those things who have Chiari malformation. It's not clear to me that treating the Chiari makes those things better. Now, where it gets hard is if those, um, if the patients are grossly symptomatic in other ways. So are they having apneas that they're not getting appropriate sleep? Are they always in pain so they can't pay attention? Are there, so um, I think in those cases, it's very easy to see the relationship because you see a clear improvement by fixing that those primary symptoms that maybe are, are there. Um, I think it's hard, especially in, in young kids and some of the differences too, kind of treating kids versus adults is the ability to take the history and, and kind of have the discussion with the patient and say, these are the things I want you to look for over the next six weeks. Tell me what you find, because I know I have a number of patients who come into me and, you know, when I first ask about straining, you're like, oh, yeah, no, it doesn't really. And then, you know, a week later or two weeks later, they'll call to be like, oh, my God, I didn't realize like I was out and I laughed really hard and that caused my headache. And so I think it's a lot easier. And this is where I think, you know, patients can really be helpful is really drilling down on you know, when the symptoms happen, what are they doing when they happen, how it happens, I think really makes it, it easier to try to figure out, you know, a uh, causative uh, relationship. Obviously, there's exceptions to everything. So I think things like speech delay, I think usually I would refer those patients for a neuropsych evaluation um, first and have them have some kind of assessment and if they can't find anything and there's not really anything else and it's a, a significant Chiari on imaging, then it, it's a discussion. Look, we don't know if this is going to help or not, but you've had this full assessment. Nobody has anything else. You know, we can do something and see. And that kind of goes back to what I said in the slide before about imaging and symptoms. So meaning I'm going to be much more likely to discuss surgery in a patient like that if they have a two centimeter Chiari with tonsils to see, you know, C2 and you look at them like, wow, that's really tight versus kind of a soft call Chiari where it's, eh, maybe it's a little tight there. I think the further you get away from the symptoms that we really kind of are very comfortable attributing to Chiari. Um, I think it tends to, at least in my mind, I want more, I almost want the imaging to be worse um, in that way. And I think speech delay, developmental delay, I think it definitely can happen. But again, kind of like with low back pain, the majority of patients with speech delay and developmental delay do not have Chiari malformation. So I think it's important to rule out other causes first. Do you, um, what do you usually tell parents, I guess, particularly in younger kids, uh, to look for um, 
it, so say they they have a Chiari on their scan, not sure if it's necessarily related. Do, what what do you tell the parents to go home and watch for, especially in really young kids? So I mean, in, in the babies, you're you know I guess for a baby to get an MRI, there had to really be something. But um, you know, in the babies, we worry more about kind of the sleep disordered breathing symptoms. Um, and uh, and potentially swallowing issues. A lot of times, babies with bad carries will sleep in a hyper extended position. Um, you know, I had one really uh, uh, young girl who, when she would cry, would then grab at the back of her head after she cried. So kind of the the crying was the valsalving, or you know, if they're constipated, you know, and then they they do things. I think as they get older. Um, you know, and maybe aren't the best historians, but again, I think the best, the best predictor, and I think there's a lot of literature out there on this, is really that cough, quote, cough headache, that pretty much every paper talks about that those patients tend to respond. Um, and so there may be patients who don't have those things who can't respond, but I think those are the best things. So if a child, like when they go out and play, they're coming back in because they have a headache. Um, you know, so so strain induced, if they're constipated and they're complaining, those types of things, really symptoms with straining. I had one, I think four year old who every time she got a cold and so she was coughing and sneezing a lot would get bad headaches. So those are are the types of things I tend to, to tell them to look for in younger kids. Okay. I'm gonna shift gears a tiny bit. Um, so, I guess I'm first going to ask you to explain what fibromyalgia is, and then how do you I, parse out the symptoms of Chiari versus if it's fibromyalgia? So I'm, I'm going to qualify that with saying I'm probably not the best person to give a definition of fibromyalgia, um, because obviously it's not a, a neurosurgical um, diagnosis. But it, I mean, it's a effectively the way I think of it, it it's a, a pain syndrome you know related to the to the soft tissue um, and so I think you know I, personally I tend to think that somebody who comes in with kind of whole body pain or, or things where I can you know one of the things I often ask or do is ask the point where it hurts and then kind of just press on that area. Like in the sense of if an area is tender to palpation, it's not likely symptomatic from Chiari. Me pushing on somebody's trapezius has nothing to do with what's going on at their frame and magnum. So I, I think it's really the, the constellation of symptoms. I think it can get hard and confusing in patients who have fibromyalgia and may also have Chiari to say, you know, to get to the bottom of what pain may be fibromyalgia, what pain may be Chiari. And I think in those, I tend to go back to the, to the strain induced and, and I'll actually, you know, ask patients to bear down and ask them what happened. And is that symptom that they get with doing that, is that the symptom that really bothers the staff? Or is there something else? Because at the end of the day, especially in, you know, in the adults who are obviously going to be more likely to have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, I think teenagers and through versus, say, a five-year-old, um, you know, it becomes in the absence of syrinx or other things, it really becomes a quality of life decision in the sense of what are the symptoms we're trying to help and what's the likelihood that Chiari intervention is going to help that? So anytime we're talking about, you know, as a surgeon, all we're really talking about is surgery. So every discussion is a risk benefit analysis um, in the sense of, you know, what's the risk of surgery? So obviously there's going to be some differences based on how you do the surgery. Are you doing a bone only? Are you opening the dura? Are you doing a fusion? Kind of all of, all of those things. Um, versus what's the likelihood of benefit? Um, and so if after the discussion, like this is low likelihood of benefit, then you're probably not going to be willing to take much risk um, for an operation um, versus if, if it's something where, 
you know, you have a cough induced headache that you've stopped being able to do all the things you like to do, you know, that's, that's, to me, that's a no brainer that, you know, we can make that better. Um, and, and so it, it's worthwhile, but I think, and this is where it, it gets hard. If you have, you know, the, then, you know, population studies, you see quoted anywhere from one in a hundred to one in a thousand people will have a Chiari. My guess is that those, as more and more people get MRIs, whether we may see numbers may get closer to one in a hundred versus the one in a thousand. And depending on how you're defining it again, based on it, the, you know, five millimeters, three millimeters level of space at the frame and magnum. Um, but when you have millions or billions of people in the world, and if that's one in a thousand, the problem is if you have another diagnosis that's one in a thousand, you're talking about millions of people that have both. Um, and it's not, it's true, true and unrelated. So I think one of the biggest things is trying to, you know, on a, a patient by patient basis, figure out what are the things that, that we think we can help and what are the things that, that, that we can't. And sometimes you're left not knowing and, and it becomes a trial. Um, and I think those are the patients, especially where I think it's worthwhile to try other things first that are lower risk, like physical therapy or migraine meds or other things, depending on what the symptoms are. Again, because if those help, then, then that's more evidence that maybe you shouldn't take the risks of, of an operation. Uh, good point. Um, so this is what can be done for, I guess, Meniere's disease. So, but like tinnitus and kind of vertigo issues is, is that Chiari, can a Chiari surgery help with that or what else can be done? So, yes. Yeah, so I think the, the ear things definitely are kind of some of the more confounding, um, in the sense of. I've had a number of patients who've had that as a symptom where it's gotten better and a number of patients where it hasn't. Uh, usually, I, if the primary complaints are ear complaints, um, I, I do like them to see ENT first. And I actually brought up the patient of a patient who came to me from ENT who actually did have many years. We did the Chiari decompress. Like she got, she, ENT did a steroid injection for the many years, symptoms got better. Um, we did a Chiari decompression, searing got better, tufts of headaches got better, but a couple of months later after her steroid injection wore off, the many years came back, her searing was still better, she got another steroid injection in her ear and it got better. Um, so I think I, I've had patients who've had a kind of a pressure in their ears that they say get better. I've had patients with tinnitus that um, some didn't change at all, some got a little better, some got completely better. Um, I think that, you know, goes to the, the questions I brought up in the slides before as number one, is it related? Number two, what's the likelihood of making it better if it is related? Um, and I think both of those we don't know good answers to. And that's where really kind of a clear, like recording that data on everybody and looking for those things every time is where I think, and I think where a lot of these studies are going to come in is it's not going to be a definitive answer, but it's going to be 50% of the time, if you have tinnitus, it's going to get better. 50% it's not. In my practice, I would say it's, I have not operated on someone purely for tinnitus because again, I think the, the likelihood of, of success is you know is going to be lower but you know somebody who gets dizzy with valsalva that may be something that may be a symptom that may be more likely and I, I think you know all of these things it's really a discussion of relative likelihood and risk and that's where i think just having better data you know allows us to have a better conversation and say you know, 70% versus 40% versus 20%. Um, uh, I have a patient recently referred to me that actually has hearing loss in one ear um, and was found on that imaging to have a Chiari. And, and so we're discussing, you know, is that worth doing something for? 
Um, I don't think they actually want to do anything, but you know, that's, those are kind of the questions. I was talking with my ENT colleague and said, you know, this would be interesting if, if we did decompress her and, and her uh, audiogram got better. Um, you know, there's some studies out there that uh, looked at bears, which is auditory evoked potentials in the OR that, that some people thought there were improvements in bears with Chiari decompression. Um, I don't think that's an always thing. And I had a patient recently who had normal bears who had hearing loss. So I, again, you know, all these tests are, um, um, can be, can be a little bit you know, confusing and hard to put into the absolute categories. Not infallible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving from ears to eyes, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, in your experience, have you seen cases where Chiari patients had impaired vision? Um, and I'm going to actually, that's a little different question. So I'll just start there. <laughs> um, so I, I guess it depends on what we mean by visual impairment. I think there's probably more reports of eye movement abnormalities per se than actual acuity changes. Um, again, these are, are some of the ones I have a harder time putting together with that anatomical correlation. I think, um, you know, our visual cortex obviously doesn't really, uh, that process doesn't come down to the, um, the cerebellum. Where, and, and brainstem, whereas eye movements obviously do. So I think there's more reports on, on movement changes. Now, I think sometimes, you know, the thinking about other disease processes, et cetera, you know, obviously patients with pseudotumor cerebri from elevated pressure can get Chiari. And so I think, you know, again, starting with, an ophthalmology evaluation and are there those things and what are the findings? And I think even doing the guidelines, I saw a couple of case reports. Again, it's like five patients. There's something that nystagmus improved with a Chiari decompression. Again, that's not enough data to say, hey, we should be doing decompressions on all these people. So it, it happens, um, but I personally have not had acuity changes in, in patients. Okay. Um, then Moving to actually hydrocephalus, so kind of a pressure. Um, how common is tonsillar descent in hydrocephalus patients? Does shunting of the ventricles ever change the position of the tonsils, I guess? Um, yes. So, I mean, I think it's one of those things where when, when as a neurosurgeon, especially as a pediatric neurosurgeon, when I think of the term hydrocephalus, to me that means ventricles plus pressure. And so it's really the pressure phenomenon that I think has more to do with the Chiari. Obviously, if we have massive ventricles, you know, everything's kind of pushed by them and, and usually you're going to get the, the pressure related to that. Um, so I, patients with massive ventricles, I've seen Chiari's that then or you treat the hydrocephalus and the Chiari gets better. Patients with elevated intracranial pressure, you can see Chiari that you treat the intracranial pressure and then it gets uh, better. So sometimes patients with traumatic injuries with severe TBIs where the whole brain is swollen, you'll see Chiari malformation from elevated intracranial pressure that then when the pressure gets better, it gets better. I think the, the hydrocephalus question with regard to Chiari can be complicated in the sense of if there is, you know, it, sometimes it's a chicken and egg question in the sense of, you know, is the Chiari causing the hydrocephalus? Is the hydrocephalus causing the Chiari? I would say in my experience, the, the first, me, or, um, the hydrocephalus causing Chiari is much more common than Chiari causing hydrocephalus. Um, I have a few patients that came to me with a bad Chiari and big ventricles. And, you know, I did a combined surgery where we put a drain in to kind of measure the pressure and decompress the, the Chiari based on the symptoms. And, you know, I have one patient, for instance, who never, with big ventricles, never required a shunt because we, by decompressing the Chiari, the ventricles actually got smaller. 
that patient had specific anatomical findings on their imaging that made me think that. Um, I think in most cases, hydrocephalus is the primary problem and you, you would wanna treat that first. Um, same thing, I have patients with pseudotumor that have a Chiari and, and my typical recommendation in that case is to treat the pseudotumor first because the Chiari may get better. Um, and only after the pseudotumor has been fully treated would I then think about doing a, a Chiari decompression because I've taken care of a number of patients with a missed diagnosis of pseudotumor who came to me with massive pseudomeningoceles because their dura didn't, they, they developed massive leaks because of the pressure. Um, um, okay. I'm going to move on to a question that we got earlier uh, before today. So after surgery for Chiari and syringomyelia, there are a couple of questions here. I'm going to start, I'm going to have them all do separately. Uh, why is it that there's still maybe too much spinal fluid or I guess not enough space even after surgery? And why do headaches persist or pain? Um, so that's a little bit of a difficult question to answer without, um, you know, like looking at imaging, honestly, in the sense of, um, I'm not sure what it means by too much spinal or brain fluid in the sense of, is it hydrocephalus um, or um, is there a, a searing still? I think, you know, what's, what I would potentially say is, I mean, there's really two options. And I think this is a general answer that's probably not going to be satisfying to ever ask the question, but either either it it wasn't the problem or the surgery wasn't sufficient. Uh, like um, in the sense of if, if there's persistent pain, then was the pain not from that? Either the pain wasn't from it or there, there wasn't enough of a decompression. Um, but like I said, in, in the sense of those are things that, that we tend to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis based on on the imaging um, and you know I don't know like what having too much spinal or brain fluid means like is that hydrocephalus if that's the case then then I would say it may be that hydrocephalus needs to be treated um, this actually was a question that came up in the chat too I'm going to ask it in a sort of different way what are some of the alternatives? So what are the latest non-surgical interventions for Chiari? Um, if, if surgery, quote unquote, fails or if it's just not helping, what do we need? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, if, if surgery fails, uh, I, I think, you know, and, and a lot of times surgical failure is related to kind of not having the appropriate discussion ahead of time in the sense of what are we expecting to gain? What are we expecting to get better? Um, and so again, with surgical failure, there's two options. Either the surgery wasn't sufficient. So was it a space problem and we didn't make enough space? Was there a spinal fluid outflow obstruction um, that we didn't open? Or are it things that um, that weren't necessarily related to to the Chiari? I think, in terms of alternative treatments, it kind of go, alludes back to what I was kind of discussing before, in the sense of, um, you know, my personal philosophy, whether it's right or wrong, it's my opinion, um, is that the symptoms that get better with other treatments probably aren't from Chiari. Um, in the sense of, you know, like if you have neck pain that you do physical therapy for and stretching and strengthening makes it better, then, then you shouldn't do surgery for Chiari. And so I, I would say it's just a, if the imaging looks good and there's not concerns on that, then it, it's more to me, a, um, a marker to kind of look for for other etiologies or other things that that we can treat 
Um, and usually that's kind of like the discussion I like to have actually before a surgery um, about, again, what do we expect? What do I have a high likelihood of thinking we're going to make better versus not? Um, so that if, you know, three months later, symptoms one through three are better and four through six aren't, then that, you know, if that's kind of what we expected, then that fits. Um, and so two, I think what I often say, and again, whether it's, you know, more based on my opinion, if, if we do a surgery and the kind of the classic symptoms get better, and other things don't. So I have patients who now can have a bowel movement with having, without getting a headache or can cough and laugh and sneeze and strain and they can work out again. And those get completely better and other symptoms don't, then to me that suggests it's probably not something that we're going to improve with surgery. Now, again, it gets back to is it related or is it related and improvable? Um, you know, that, that's what it's, you know, a little bit harder to say. Like if you've had a hearing change for 10 years, even if it was from that, is the nerve injured? So now it's not going to improve. Um, but I tend to think, um, you know, in a lot of cases, it makes it in my mind less likely to be related. If we can, if we can make the classic symptoms better and the other stuff doesn't. Um, I'm going to get into this a little bit. I know you talk about this with relative frequency at our meetings. So, um, is it okay to have spinal fluid removed by lumbar puncture every year? I know there's a lot of, I, so I guess they're, they're asking annually, but there's a lot of people who ask questions about um, LPs and um, the possibility of kind of introducing some pressure issues. So I don't know if you can speak to it a bit. I mean, I guess the question is, why are we doing a spinal tap every year um, in the sense of, um, you know, I think I would not do it to treat symptoms of Chiari or, or things like that. Now, if the question is getting at because of risk of developing Chiari, then I think it's treatable with blood patch for the most part. So if you get a, a uh, low pressure symptoms and even can develop Chiari, from it. I have patients who um, who came to me for Chiari that, you know, based on certain criteria on imaging or other things, we realized it was low pressure that was causing the Chiari. And with blood patches, the Chiari actually gets better. Um, and we have imaging showing the Chiari being lower and then the tonsils actually elevating. It's the same thing. We said the easiest thing in neurosurgery is the acquired Chiari from, say, a lumboperitoneal shunt. That, like, you have a shunt in your um, lumbar space that's draining, and you'll see a Chiari. And in those cases, that's sometimes a reason to, to no, I don't like putting lumboperitoneal shunts in, period. Um, but if someone has it, then that's a reason to potentially convert it to a VP shunt. And usually, when you do that, you'll see the Chiari get better. Um, so, I mean, I think if there's, you know, oncology patients will get spinal taps for treatment. So there, if there's kind of a, a good medical indication to do it, I think, you know, it's something that, that, you know, can be done. And if people just develop symptoms from it, then, you know, it can be treated. Now, there is the question of if you have a bad Chiari, should you get an LP? And I think that's, more of a case by case basis because if you if you already have a symptomatic Chiari, could you make it worse enough that that something kind of bad happens because of it? And so I think that's something that um, you know has to be evaluated on a on a patient by patient basis. But in general, a patient without a Chiari, um, you know, if they have a good reason to have an LP, I don't I wouldn't say that they shouldn't. Um, but just if they develop symptoms, then get it get it checked out and that's a good history right like in the sense of you know why might you have low pressure i had to see two weeks ago um that that's an easy um an, an easy kind of story to put together um okay then a question had come in and it boils down to how long after sur in, in adults, how long after surgery do symptoms generally persist before like things start to get better? And I guess it boils down to when is it probably time to just 
talk to your surgeon either about having surgery again or seeing what else might be causing your issue? So I think that can be a hard question based on a lot of patients can have trouble immediately after surgery differentiating the post-operative pain from the pain related to Chiari. Now, I have some patients who can clearly tell me the difference and other patients where it just kind of hurts back here um, and it's, it's hard to get at. The other thing is after the surgery, um, the muscles being tight here can cause frontal headaches. So you can get all kinds of headaches related to the surgery. I would say most patients by about a month out, I mean, I would say for the most part, a lot of patients by, you know, one to two weeks out, um, the post-op pain has gotten better enough to the extent. Now, the hard thing is if you strain and your muscles are tight, like the, the Valsalva can can cause post-operative pain as well. Um, but, you know, I usually um, feel like by a month, you know, a lot of times by two weeks even, people will be like, I'm barely taking meds. I'm not having these symptoms anymore. Um, for the patients who have a really stiff neck after, you know, at about a month, that's when I might recommend some therapy. I don't, most of my patients, I, I don't routinely send people to PT, but the patients who still have a really stiff neck at about a month out, that's where I would sometimes consider it um, to see if that kind of helps. Usually I give people to about the three month mark, which is usually in my practice when I get a scan. Um, interestingly, there are sometimes patients, especially, um, you know, and I think I'd probably see this a little bit more at the bone only group than the, the duroplasty, the patients who kind of see a clear improvement, you know, initially, and then slowly see a recurrence of symptoms over time. And I think that probably has to do with, you know, as I tell my patients is I feel like I'm pretty good at looking and seeing if there's enough space, but I'm really bad at predicting how people scar and how scar may may influence the amount of, of space. Um, and so I like to see some improvement though before, um, you know, usually the classic story for that again is I was feeling great for a period of time. I could do these things and now gradually I feel like more and more I'm seeing recurrence of the symptom. Um, but I tend to like to give it three months. I think with a syrinx, um, you know, the, the studies suggest that if you have a bone only, the syrinx may take longer to get better. So for syrinx, I think bone only, people say even up to a year to look for improvement. Um, but I, you know, I usually like to see some changes at three months, although I, I wouldn't necessarily go right back to surgery at that point um, if, if it wasn't um, exactly what we were hoping for. That's actually a good point. Um, we've had questions about it before, but uh, in your experience with like scarring or even like arachnoiditis, is that something that, how is that usually handled and how do you even know if it is a problem? Um, so I tend to think, when I think of scar, I think of it more from the perspective of extradural scar and and reason why um, we, you know, even though it seemed like when we were in the OR, we made enough space, we, we lose space. Um, I think arachnoiditis is a, a, is a little bit more complicated. Um, and because I think that tends to develop over a longer time period, more so for it to cause issues. Now, I think uh, chemical meningitis is something that obviously doesn't happen if you don't open the dura, but is something that, that I really do think happens the more you do intradurally, the likelihood of it happening is higher. Um, those symptoms though, in most cases, tend to resolve within the first month. Um, you know, usually what, you know, my suspicion for chemical meningitis, the patient that's doing well and then 10 to 14 days after surgery, presents with a meningitis picture, like low grade fevers, you know, neck stiffness, et cetera. Um, you know, and my, my standard practice, if that was the case, is actually more likely to 
just kind of consider a course of steroids um, rather than because of that history. Now, if it was different timing or different things or kind of the story is different, then obviously you have to be cognizant of the risk of infection. But I would say that the, the times I've seen chemical meningitis is far more likely than, than infectious. And that being said, I haven't necessarily seen long-term complications or ramifications from the patients who had chemical meningitis, like arachnoiditis, et cetera. I guess, you know, my practice that I don't have any patients who've been out more than say 11 years or so though. So I guess time will tell. Uh. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna wrap it up by asking a question. We started today talking about all the ways that we're trying to research this stuff. And I know this patient and caregiver population is particularly interested in making sure that we get that level one evidence that we just really don't have right now. The, the first one that we're gonna get isn't even published yet, but it, it is done like we were talking about. Um, but how can patients and caregivers help doctors, I guess, or any medical professional parse out all this stuff. So we talked about not knowing what was actually related to the Chiari versus something else. Um, is there any way that patients can get involved to, I guess, try to speed this up a little bit it, robustly? So I guess that's that's more of a plug for your organization, right? In the sense of, yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously um, participating in any kind of research studies that people can participate in, I think, um you know from the and you know even going to centers where there is research going on um so that you can be more involved in those types of things and i think um you know obviously you guys can give a list of the cssf centers and um you know different things and you know patient registries where you can input your own data i think um also, just the the clarity in which patients can kind of present their own data, like in the sense of, you know, and this may not help if if it's not somewhere where the research is being done, but, you know, so for instance, for the Park Reeves, um, you know, it's like, I don't know how many pages, like the, the data sheet is um, that that gets filled out, but you know, the more information and the more specific information that that patients have, I think the more it can. And so I think as as we come up with studies and and patient questionnaires and things that that people can fill out, just kind of completing those things and and, and trying to, you know, give the most information. Obviously, I think the thing that's going to be the most helpful and you know the way we're trying to set it up is to have combined data of what the doctors and physicians are recording and what the patients are recording because i think it's very important to bring those two things together because if you have you know just a patient registry that says hey i had surgery this got better and you're going based on what a radiology report says or what a you know what a surgeon says i think that data is not as good as if if that form is kind of compiled with a a specific kind of you know surgical parameters that are measured and radiology parameters measured by a radiologist kind of looking at these things so i think just trying to um you know be involved in the places that are trying to you know as 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 permissible by life um, to to kind of try to gravitate towards the places that are that are doing the work so that they can be included, I guess is the the best way I can think about it. Or or working through advocacy groups like um, yours and and filling things out through like registries, et cetera. Yeah, and so to get to that, so if someone wanted to get in touch with you. So as you mentioned, you, you're trying to build the registry at Hopkins specifically. Um, 
if a patient was going to come to you for Chiari consultation and maybe they're interested in that research, is there a way that they can get in touch with someone at Hopkins that would be able to do that? Or do they just come through the clinic and how would they do that? Right. So I think that's, like I said, right now it's a work in progress. Um, we are hopefully, hopefully we'll be getting funded soon. I think until that comes through, then there, that isn't happening. It's, you know, to make it happen, it requires people working to do the job. And so I think, you know, once, you know, once hopefully it comes through, then it probably would be the, the fact that, you know, could come through the clinic or a research coordinator that we would have, like our hope is to have a dedicated Chiari research coordinator. Um, and so it could come through them who would then refer to kind of the clinical side or could come through the clinical side to there. Um, just so happens that timing wise, we're, we're not able to, to really say it's there, but I would, I would hope that in the, in the next month or so, um, at least would be starting the process and probably wouldn't necessarily have people in roles yet and have to kind of develop the database. Um, and, you know, a lot of work will go into it before actually starting. And what the other thing that I think patients don't often realize is the level of administrative work that goes into getting a study approved. Um, and so even if we get everything kind of in place, the time for the institutional review boards to say that, yes, this is, we agree with you doing this for the data trust of the institution to say, yes, the data is safe. Um, so it, unfortunately, it's a it's a slow moving process. Um, but I, you know, my hope is that we'll be, we'll be starting that process soon. But I think in the meantime, you know, I think going through clinical um, kind of ways. And I think one of the great things about working at a place like Hopkins is there's things like there's a number online for Hopkins USA where you can be anywhere in the country and call them and they can, there's a concierge that kind of helps people kind of navigate the system to, um, to get in to see one of us. Yeah, um, and that's just online, so I'll include it in the uh, the notes for the video when this gets up. But if someone wanted to see you specifically, uh, you're on the hot, the website. Oh my gosh, the website. Yeah, so I mean that's the type of thing too that they can call Hopkins USA and request to see me specifically. Um, you know, our our referral system. Um, in general, if it just comes through like as Chiari malformation, then it, it gets triaged by our, our chair. And so it may come to me, it may come to somebody else. Whereas if somebody calls and says, I want to see Dr. Jackson, then it just gets sent directly to me and not, not triaged through other people. Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I'm going to thank Dr. Jackson so much for doing this with us today. It was really great. And I nerd out a lot on like the actual research stuff. So that was really fun for me. <laughs> um, but thanks everyone for joining us. And Dr. Jackson, thank you for doing this with us. It was great. Thank you. Hopefully it was helpful for people.